voting. Okay, I would like to request anyone on the call right now to please lead in prayer. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Go. Go ahead, brother. Thank you. No. 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 You. You carry on. Okay. Thank you so much. Good morning, ma'am. Yeah. Am I audible, ma'am? Yes. Yes, Abhinash. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. So let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful time and beautiful day, Lord Jesus. This morning we choose to praise you, we choose to honor you, Lord Jesus, we choose to glorify your name, Father God. Thank you for this time, Lord Jesus, as we are going through this session, Lord Jesus. We ask you your presence, Father God. We want to be in your presence, Lord Jesus, till the end of this class, Lord Jesus. And we ask you more of your revelation, Father God. We ask you more of your understanding, Father God. Help us to in a deeper way, Father God, so that we can learn your word, Father God, and so that, so that we can apply in your word, Lord Jesus, not for ourselves, but it's for your kingdom, Lord Jesus. We submit, Pastor Nancy, to your mighty hand, Jesus, Father God, as he is, as he is speaking, Father God. Speak, help, help, us, help us to speak to edify us, Lord Jesus, to comfort us, comfort us, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father God. We submit all the fellows to your mighty hand, Jesus, and we ask this pray In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Abhinash. Um, uh, welcome once again. Some more friends have joined. So glad to have you in this class and uh, excited to learn about the next topic in this course, which is the apostolic we have seen that the Lord Jesus has uh, given gifts. We call the fivefold ministry offices as the gifts of Christ in Ephesians 4 uh, verses 11 and 12. We see this. Uh, one is the prophetic. The other is the apostolic. Okay, And uh, we have also seen well, with regard to the prophetic, we've seen the progression. We've seen how prophecy is a gift of the Holy Spirit and someone can exercise it as a believer. Someone can have the grace gift of prophecy, thereby their ministry is marked with prophecy. And then uh, there are people whom the Lord Jesus has appointed in the office of a prophet. And the apostolic is very similar. So we will try and understand it. The best way to understand, uh, you know, biblical the truth is from scripture. I know that there is a lot of content out there. There's a lot of teaching out there. There are, um, you know, many references to this word apostolic, apostle. Uh, so our tendency is that, you know, we, we want to get a hold of everything that is available. I understand it because we are hungry and we want to find out more. But the best way to get a hold of God's word is always through scripture. So uh, even when we studied the prophetic, you will re realize that we began with studying passages uh, uh, in God's word about what it meant to hear from God. Then how did people hear from God in the Old Testament? So every uh, incident in the Old Testament where People are connecting, people are uh, picking up the communication of God. We studied it and then we went on to the New Testament and we saw there, you know, how is it that that uh, the prophetic looks there and uh, the progression of the prophetic. So every conclusion that we came to was based on God's word. You know, then we built on it. We came to the practical aspects and said that in the in the interpretation of uh, personal prophecy in the application of personal prophecy here are some practical things that we must bear in mind in uh, the leading of a church as a prophetic uh, congregation or a ministry so that you know we are prophetic in this ministry how do we do it so you see that there is a good foundation of scripture and on that we have uh, understood the practical aspects of applying uh, what this entire anointing is about. And another thing that, you know, we saw is that over the years, you know, the, the truth about the prophetic has uh, become clearer and clearer. And uh, the same applies to the apostolic. We will build from scripture and then we will come to the practical aspects of it. Um, and, uh, you know, the truth about the apostolic, once again, it's becoming clearer and clearer um, as the church is experiencing more of this anointing. And we said that uh, we will see 
know, more of the manifestation of the prophetic and the apostolic uh, in the in the church or the global body of Christ. Um, and so, you know, it's something for us to keep our eyes open for and also pray that we will be able to release this anointing to whatever extent God wants us to. So let's begin with our uh, first chapter here. I have posted the notes for the Google Classroom students on your uh, classwork page. Uh, so if you have, I mean, if you've, if you've gone there, you could just uh, download it and follow along. Um, yeah. All right. So chapter one here, and I am on page two. It's just an introduction of the apostolic, and that's what uh, we have for today. Uh, so what we see here is that the apostolic, you know, the age uh, that we are in right now, we know that God is restoring you know, the fivefold ministry offices. And I uh, also touched upon the fact that we are beginning to see more of it and our understanding also is deepening as far as the anointings of the fivefold ministry offices is concerned. So just looking back at church history a little bit, I know that this is there, uh, you know, we touch on this on many courses, in many courses um, in the Bible college. Uh, so we've seen that in the between like 400, 2400 AD, the church was a spiritually feeble entity during the dark ages. And um, post that, you know, the, the revival and restoration of the church uh, began to uh, come through. So then we see the emergence of the Protestant movement where people had an understanding of salvation through grace. We then see the Puritan movement where people understood the importance of water baptism and also the separation of church from state. Uh, in the 1700s, there is the holiness movement that we talk about, you know, names like John Wesley are all very popular with regard to the holiness movement, how the church understood that, you know, along with, along with our um, committing ourselves to God, you know, comes this, this requirement for us to live a sanctified life. And uh, so a believer has to have a holy life. And therefore, you know, uh, God poured that out on the hearts of people. And then, you know, globally, you, you see in different parts of the world, people had uh, this, this uh, emphasis and uh, holiness was, was something that the church was pursuing. Then in the 1800s, you know, it's a time where there are uh, many, many, uh, you know, uh, occurrences of uh, healings, okay, divine healings, and you have uh, notable men and women of God who were anointed by God uh, to minister healing and deliverance to people. And so the church began to understand that, yes, you know, this is also something that, God is demonstrating in his body and people had that uh, confidence that, you know, the way the Lord Jesus spoke in his word, that yes, he is somebody who heals the physical body of people. 1900s, 1900s, we see uh, the emergence of the pen movement, the baptism in the Holy Spirit, you know, Azusa Street Revival, uh, all those, all those things took place. And so uh, the understanding of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the gifts, manifestation of the gifts of the Spirit, you know, that is something that people uh, began to accept and uh, uh, teach all around. So following the Pentecostal movement in the 2000s, this is where you know, we've been saying that there is I mean, it's not that when we say that, you know, all these truths were restored to the church, it's not that they were non-existent, but it is more like the understanding became deeper and the work of the Holy Spirit in all these areas became stronger. Uh, and, and so you, know, you could say that the church or the global church was kind of fortified in a way with these truths, uh, uh, you know, in, in, a, um, in a very strong way. So that's what we mean. So from the 2000s, this whole understanding of the fivefold ministry offices and the anointings pertaining to the fivefold ministry offices is being restored back to the church more and more. And, uh, you know, many things could have or the manifestation of these anointings has always existed. Not that it hasn't existed, but, you know, when we say understanding, it's more like 
we now have in a way language to explain you know what what exactly god has been doing so uh, that way many people understand what the apostolic is about or the what the prophetic is about and uh, of course you know god is pouring out more of his spirit greater works are being performed so that's what is happening and thereby as believers we should understand the importance of what god is doing so now that we have touched upon the prophetic now we know the importance and uh, we also realize that as an individual or as a leader uh we have to move in that direction and similarly the apostolic we will understand the importance and we'll know why uh, for us as believers we need to have that apostolic mindset so our best example always even when we talked about the prophetic we said that jesus uh, uh was a prophet in himself uh, and so you know there were scriptures we looked at where people uh, where jesus said a prophet is not respected in his own um among his own people so he was calling himself a prophet and we saw how the prophetic anointing worked through him jesus is somebody who has the anointing in uh, all the areas of the fivefold ministry offices and that is why in scripture we see that you know uh, jesus is said to be someone who had the spirit without measure spirit without measure is all the uh, fivefold ministry office anointings were in one person now that is uh, unusual you generally don't have that uh, among you know regular people maybe a couple of anointings manifest here and there but the lord jesus uh, is somebody who is appointed in all the fivefold ministry offices so hebrews chapter 3 and verse 1 could somebody please turn to that uh, scripture and read it for us in this course i will be asking us to read passages of scripture so please be prepared if you have you know your bibles open uh, Uh, online then that would be good or just keep a copy of the uh, bible with you so hebrews 3 1 uh, if someone can read that we can explain it and move ahead thank you hebrews i, I am reading please yes yes go ahead elisha go ahead hebrews chapter 3 verse 1 i am reading from the esv therefore holy brothers you who share in the heavenly calling consider jesus the apostle and the high priest of our confession amen yes thank you thank you lisha so what version was that esv in english standard okay. version yes we okay thank you so uh, i'm looking at the same scripture in nkjv version and again you know it says the apostle and high priest of our confession christ jesus so clearly you know, the lord jesus is an apostle and uh, there is reference to that in the uh, you know scripture that we read but more so from the life that he lived and the ministry uh, that he performed so what is this word apostle if you just look up that word apostle the greek it stands for apostolos okay apostolos means sent one or a delegate and i know that because of uh, you know studying believers authority we know the meaning of delegated authority somebody who has been sent in the name of a person of authority uh, and somebody who has been approved to carry that person's authority and thereby uh, you know they all they exercise that same authority through whatever they do a good example would be let's just say you know there is a school and uh, there is um, the a principal of the school who is uh, responsible for the administration of the school but maybe uh, for a season he is not there in the school what happens is he might assign a teacher uh, uh, you know one from the existing set of teachers to to function with his authority so though this individual is a teacher uh, you understand that they have been vested 
with delegated authority from a higher a person uh, in a higher position and so when this teacher carries on the administration of the school for that duration of time um they have the powers they have the rights of that principal to whatever extent you know it has been uh, it has been listed out and within that boundary that teacher is allowed to use that power so that is a delegate so you are able to use the powers which are given to you the authority which is given to you we've seen that isn't it we've seen exousia or authority that we have in christ jesus to um do the works that the lord jesus did so now that we have an understanding of authority and being sent and being delegated apostle simply means someone who has been sent or that person is delegated okay now in the case of the lord jesus uh, it's it's quite clear for us that he was sent from heaven from by the father to fulfill his work of uh, or his mission of redemption so that's how he is an apostle he is a sent one he is a, a delegate and um, uh, therefore you know we we see him as an apostle so the word apostle okay uh, if you also kind of break it up uh, we know that it is sent the term stolos refers to from Okay, so apostle sent one from God from heaven, and uh, he became a representative of God for us here on the earth. And we have seen his authority and power. And everyone who looked at the Lord Jesus, you know, remarked and said, "Oh, what authority! He speaks with great authority." And uh, the disciples were also amazed when they saw him do uh, the works of the kingdom so you know he demonstrated the authority and the power of the kingdom of god or the kingdom of heaven uh, and in that manner you know, he he showed that he is a sent one apos stolos from heaven and the lord jesus you know um, uh, very simply put you know, he is an apostle and uh, his life and ministry talks about it now in the writing of the new testament obviously words of that time uh, would be used isn't it so if you go back to the language the greek language and um, the usage of the words people had uh, a certain understanding of the things around them and that is why they used you know that kind of terminology so coming to the word apost apost apostle or in greek apostolos um apparently during the times when this word was used that is the new testament times you had a very um strong roman empire you had the the uh, greeks and the romans who would send out uh, envoys okay to go and carry out these these um, um invasions or you know they would they would conquer uh, piece regions uh, around them and they would try to establish their own kingdom so when they would send out these envoys you know they would they would call them apostolos okay so when the term apostle is used in scripture the people of the those times understood in a in a way what it meant because it was referring to um you know somebody like uh, an ambassador you know somebody like uh, uh, you know a, a a conqueror who would be sent out uh, as a representative of the you know the romans or the greeks they would go and they would take over a land uh, and not just that you know they would they would um uh, establish the kingdom or uh, establish their own kingdom in the new region so that would involve you know subduing people that would uh, involve uh, conquering if there are um, opposing voices conquering those opposing voices it would mean um, let's say you know they have uh, taken charge of the place and now everyone is 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 uh, in line with what they want to do from that point on uh, there's some amount of equipping training uh, you know and and uh, establishing the new subjects of the land uh, according to the 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 government rules that they have okay, so if it is the romans then you know they would have their uh, their rules that will apply to that region so in 
a matter of time like if you if you go to that place and you um look at the place you would see a you know like a small roman kingdom established uh, in in that place but earlier uh, it was a completely different land okay uh, ruled by somebody else having pr- different principles values standards and all that but an apostle uh, or you know uh, an ambassador sent during those times had the responsibility to enter this place and establish the kingdom that you know they represented so for the new testament believers the word apostle brought that understanding okay somebody who is leading the change in a new territory okay so that is the understanding of the term apostle and they were obviously sent from a kingdom to do this and so when we apply it to ourselves you know we now have the understanding of the kingdom of god and so as representatives of the kingdom of god we here who are living in the world but we are not of the world and we represent a spiritual kingdom we are not talking about some kind of a literal kingdom uh, which exists in on the earth right now that's not what we are talking about it's a spiritual kingdom the kingdom of the lord jesus the kingdom of the son of god the kingdom um, you know that has the light uh, of uh, the son of god so you know we are citizens of this spiritual kingdom and in the way we approach the things uh, of this life um, and you know new new doors that open to us or new territories again in a spiritual sense that are given to us you know our responsibility is to uh, see the kingdom of god come upon that so that is why jesus also taught us to pray thy kingdom come thy will be done you know that's very apostolic prayer so what are we saying we're saying god you know let your kingdom take over the kingdom of righteousness peace joy justice you know all that whatever uh, the kingdom of the son of god represents let that take over and here we are as representatives of that kingdom so you know uh, when we use the term apostle apostolic that is what should come to our minds and that is what we see um you know in the usage of that greek word apostolos and obviously our best example again about someone who established the kingdom of god kingdom of heaven on the earth who came from stolos came from heaven is the lord jesus okay so we always look to the example of the lord jesus as an apostle so uh, in scripture we see that the term apostle is also used for the 12 disciples of jesus um in the book of revelation revelation 21 and verse 14 um refers to these these disciples of christ can somebody turn to revelation 21 and verse 14 please you can read it out to the class fourteen ha huh. the city yeah, yeah. Uh, the city's wall was built on 12 foundation stones on which were written the names of the 12 apostles of the lamb Mm-hmm. thank you anita so it's quite clear there so we're talking about the uh, um, the heavenly city that Uh, you know everyone is looking forward to and over there uh, there is a reference of the 12 apostles okay who um uh, 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 on whom does it say the foundation stone can you please read that again uh, <clears throat> it says uh, of the 12 foundation stones that's correct ma yeah yeah 12 foundation stones and also yeah. notice here it says um the apostles of the just a moment yeah the, the okay. apostles of the, of the lamb yeah okay the apostles of the lamb so then it's understood because in the book of revelation the lord jesus is the is the lamb of god who was slain for us so the 12 apostles of the lord jesus um and uh, uh, they are called as the 
apostles of the lamb so obviously you know we will see further we are going to look at scriptures and passages from the new testament to see the the function of these 12 apostles now some of you may have the doubt oh okay what about judas is he also considered as uh, you know one of the apostles of the lamb but you know we know that he uh, he denied his calling uh, so in the book of acts uh, you know peter calls for the selection of a new person in the place of Judas. So Matthias is the one who is, um, uh, you know, appointed by God. So they they do this lots thing and then they pick uh, Matthias as somebody who has been selected by God. So there is a replacement that has already taken place. And there are these 12 apostles of the Lamb. So uh, they are known as apostles. So Jesus, we saw, okay, he's an apostle. There are There is something called 12 apostles of the Lamb. That refers to the disciples. Mm, okay. Uh, before I go forward, uh, say, did you have a question? I saw you raise your hand. Yes, you answered it already. It was pertaining to Judas. Judas. I was oh, okay. <laughs> okay, no okay. worries. Thank All you very right. much. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, thank you. And Elisha has posted here on the chat. Does this list uh, have the name of Apostle Paul? You mean the Apostles of the Lamb, Elisha? No. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. No, Elisha, it doesn't have. Um, simply because, you know, Paul was not one of those disciples of Jesus during his earthly ministry. It's very clear that, uh, you know, he he was somebody who emerged on the scene later on. So if you study the life of Paul, um, he was impacted by the um, the martyrdom of Stephen and it is said that he could have been roughly about 25 years at that time but it's uh, you know a few years later that he had his own encounter while he was going to persecute uh, the the children of uh, I mean the the believers in Christ Jesus he had his own encounter on the road to Damascus he gave his life to God and so you know Paul's story is completely different and you do see that in some places he also talks about the fact that mm, he never um uh physically walked with jesus or he didn't learn some things uh firsthand from jesus so um, uh some things came to him by revelation okay so yeah he is not considered as the apostle of the lamb and that's very very clear uh but he is included in another set of apostles. Uh, this reference is Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20. Could someone turn to it, please? Ephesians 2 and verse 20. Yeah, I'll come to you, Louis. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20. Built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. And okay. Wonderful, wonderful. So thank you, uh, Elisha. So we see, you know, the, the context here about the believers and the church. We are built on the foundations of the apostles and prophets. So um, if you look at most of the New Testament, it was written by Apostle Paul. So there are these foundational uh, truths that have been established by apostles because obviously as we have seen the meaning of what an apostle means you know bringing the kingdom bringing the the values and the standards of the kingdom god uh, empowered certain men uh, apost uh, apostles to give us the scriptures okay so paul is one of them so paul is considered as one of the founding apostles okay so Today, we will uh, look at this hopefully later as well. We have people, are there people in the apostolic office? Yes, very much. Like the way we have people in the prophetic office. We do have, isn't it? And none of us will deny that. So are there, pro do apostles exist today? They do. But can today's prophets be, uh, can today's apostles be apostles of the Lamb? No. Apostles of the Lamb is, uh, you know, reserved or restricted to the disciples of Jesus. Founding apostles are those who have given us the scriptures. So today we cannot have founding apostles. So the apostles that we have today, their function is different. But the scripture has 
reference to uh, uh, founding apostles that would include people like paul who have given us the scriptures and, and so you know someone can't come up with uh, a, a new epistle and say hey come on include it in the bible because i am in the office of an apostle no you know that that can't be done anymore uh, but can they be an apostle with a different function very much so okay so that is our understanding mm, okay yes uh, uh, louis had I, I saw louis raising his hand so i can answer try to answer his question and then come to you say uh, louis did you want to ask anything okay uh, let's go with uh, your question say please go ahead uh, uh, mine mine is just an observation that just you know occurred to me when we read Ephesians 2 verse 20 um just to say that paul here actually acknowledges the teachings despite the fact you know most of all that he wrote was by revelation direct revelation of what christ had revealed to him but i see here that he actually kind of um uh, acknowledges the teachings of the apostles who were with jesus christ so it, it just goes to show again that um again not not every not not all that he wrote to the churches were exclusively his revelations, but also in harmony with the teachings of the founding apostles. I just wanted to raise that up just so. Yeah, excellent observation, uh, uh, say. Yeah, that's that's uh, so wonderful, isn't it? Those who were with Jesus and those who came after, uh, they were in harmony. So praise God, only the Spirit of God can do that um, across, you know, time, um, across years. So, you know, we praise God for that integrity. Um, thank you for that. Louis, you're back. Uh, you had logged off and then now you're back. Did you have a question? Um, just a, a bit of concern. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, the timeline was kind of um, quite long between when um, um, Moses' name was appointed as the 12th apostle and when um, Paul came on the scene. Um, but... Jesus Christ was the one that picked up, uh, selected his 12 apostles. Um, is, it, is it reasonable to say that that space was still vacant until Jesus himself appointed the 12th apostle? Um, not by lot, but by the election of grace. So if you want to extend the hands of election by grace, we'll have said that Paul was one, the one elected by grace to fill up the 12th position. Not what was done by um, lot, considering the sequence in which the first founding apostles were were selected uh, so there is a, a different school of thought with different um, preachers to say that um, the one that was considered by lot did not stand spiritually as to the one that was done by election of grace uh, I, I agree with Shay that most of the conversation that Paul had were based on the the, the foundations of the founding the founding fathers but those revelations also, he said, I went up to Arabia by revelation, such that when it was time for Christ to be revealed, he separated himself onto that revelation. So I don't know where we can have to put that, that balance. I'm not negating the fact that the two apostles selected by the, the 11 apostles doesn't stand. But in terms of the election of grace, considering the fact that Jesus was the one that had picked his own apostles, so do we so extend that, that um, paradigm or protocol? to Paul, or we just leave it the way it is, in terms of um, historical sequence. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Louis, for that uh, observation and that concern. Um, so you see, when we when we think of and this is again, you know, my interpretation, and I'm sharing that with you, you can definitely have ask uh, another person as well or you know research more and then come to your own conclusion uh, but see from what i see uh, if you go to acts chapter 1 uh, and uh, um, verses 20 onwards uh, we see that you know peter kind of comes up with this um, request uh, and he says that okay you know we don't have there's one person missing uh, and we have to uh, we have to elect somebody in the place of judas all right so uh 
but there is a prerequisite or there is a criteria that that they um, put in place and that was that somebody who had been you know with with the lord jesus so verse 21 therefore of these men who have accompanied us all the time that the lord jesus went in and out among us uh, verse 22 beginning from the baptism of john to that day when he was taken up from us one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection so you see it was not random they were uh, in fact the 120 people that you saw gathered in the book of acts for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, they were all people who were with Jesus. And uh, uh, though it's not mentioned, you know, 12 were close to Jesus and, you know, they were uh, day in and day out with Jesus. But then you see here in the selection of a person, they are looking for somebody who has been around, who knows the teachings and who is, you know, well-versed. And, uh, and my assumption is that obedient to the teaching of God's word as well. So that kind of an individual they look for. Uh, and uh, I, I'll just read uh, further, verse 23. And they proposed two. So they selected, okay, they selected Joseph called Barsabas, who was surnamed Justice and Matthias. So according to the apostles, they picked two, um, you know, suitable candidates. So these were not like random people that they they put a lot for and picked. So they were selected by the apostles. There were two people, verse 24, and they prayed and said, you, O Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which of these two you have chosen to take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell that he might go to his own place. 26 and they cast their lots and the lot fell on Matthias and he was numbered with the 11 apostles okay so we see that it's very very clear that a replacement for Judas is um, sought for and two among you know two were picked by the people but they prayed and asked God God who do you want to put you know, in, in the place of Judas and uh, the lot fell on Matthias. Now coming to uh, the casting of lots, you see in the Old Testament, uh, we, we saw the practices, isn't it? We said Urim, Tumim, uh, the spirit of the Lord would come upon a prophet. So one would go to a seer to know the word of the Lord. But the Old Testament believe believers or under the old covenant people had the practice of casting lots and uh, we call you know jonah when when they had to throw somebody into the sea for the sea to come down they the the people we don't know you know if they were devout jews or what kind of jews they were but they had the practice to hear from god let's cast lots okay so it's a it was if you want to call it so it was an act of faith on the part of the uh, uh, apostles here. So they used that same practice of casting lots, but it was an act of faith, we would say so. Why did God allow them to cast lots? You see, it's only in the next chapter that, um, you know, um, in, after a few days that you would find the Holy Spirit being poured upon the people, you know, baptism in the Holy Spirit and then coming uh, the, the manifestation of the gifts of the Spirit, uh, one of which is, uh, you know, prophecy, you know, through which they could, they could, they could uh, just prophesy and say, you know, and of course, it's if the Lord were to reveal that to them, they could have prophesied or got it in a dream or something like that, and then picked Matthias. But this happened before the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and that is why the casting of the lots is not negated. Okay, so um, as far as I'm concerned, Louis, I think uh, from this passage, uh, it's quite clear that uh, Matthias was a unanimous choice of the 11 and was God's choice in place of Judas. And so um, I won't even consider Paul to be put into this list of the apostles of the Lamb. Uh, but yeah, he will fit into the founding apostles category and uh, I mean I would just let him uh, stay there and not worry too much about apostle of grace and all that so uh, I mean does it make sense or yeah. no, uh, pastor you are very you are very correct I understand your your thought is valid ah. I, I understand that very valid um, yeah. by just doing it for academic sake and the, the thing is that Paul wasn't on the scene uh, when this choice was about to be made 
Paul came back years later, so they worked with what they had at the point in time. You know, but we have it in, res in um, retrospect that um, they, they, they didn't know that Paul was going to come on the scene, but we know the sequence of history now. So we're trying to um, just oppose the, the loopholes as it were, quote, the loopholes as it were. So I'm saying that you are very correct. I'm saying that just in retrospect that we have history to work with based on, because even Peter had to consider, say the things that Paul wrote were very hard to understand. So they recognize that they have recognized the apostleship of of, um, of Paul, but the choice already been made even before the appointment of the Holy Spirit. So if the Spirit was there, maybe they would not have used lots. They would have used the the concept of the the, the, the witness of the Spirit. So you are very, I'm saying you're correct, but just that because we have the the patterns of history, we are trying to see where they fit and if the choices we hold, you know. They will still hold up to now. That's what I'm saying. But you're correct. I understand what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. Sure, Louis. Uh, so, okay, I have an echo of my own voice. Okay, great. Um, so, I mean, what I'm saying is, uh, uh, you know, the apostles of the Lamb, or whether it's Paul or, you know, other apostles, we'll see some more names. Uh, they're all apostles in their own right, the way God has appointed them. And so, uh, I mean, I wouldn't... I wouldn't want to worry too much about, you know, whether uh, they fit into a certain category, apostles of the lab, or founding apostles, or everyone is an apostle of a certain type. So, you know, I would be like, okay, fine, you know, let them be. So uh, what was their function? I, I would uh, probably uh, be more concerned about that so that I can understand the outworking of the apostolic anointing. What are the things that the apostolic anointing brings to uh, the the uh, family of God, what does it bring to the world? Uh, so, you know, that that perspective. Anyway, a nice discussion there, and thank you for that question. We'll move forward. So I've just been touching on categories of apostles, and I said, okay, there are the apostles of the Lamb, then there is the list of founding apostles who gave us uh, the, you know, the, the scripture that we still follow. Uh, and then you know, we, we see that there is something called as the ministry gift of the apostles. So remember, I said that we can't, uh, we can't write out a book and say, okay, come on, include it in the Bible, because we will never uh, be one of the founding apostles. But if God has called uh, people in, in the body right now to be in the office of the apostle, uh, yes, that is acknowledged, that will be affirmed, uh, just that the outworking of that anointing will be very different from the, the outco outworking of the apostles of the Lamb or the founding apostles. So there are people today in the body of Christ who are um, appointed as apostles. Let's just read once again, um, you know, uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. A fa very familiar passage. Uh, good to reread re re it once again. Ephesians 4, 11 and 12, please. Anyone? Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. Yes. And he himself gave some to apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for edifying of the body of Christ. Amen. 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 So you see that, you know, there is there is appointment of certain people in these offices. Okay. So uh, we, we do accept people as prophets, apostles, pastors, teachers, evangelists uh, in today's time. God gives the anointing he gives the grace and you know there comes out the release of that anointing through people's lives uh now there can be um, you know we we will see uh, later on that as you look at scriptures in the new testament there are many names mentioned as apostle you know so and so an apostle so and so an apostle so uh, there can be um, uh, uh, there are apostles you know across the board uh, there can also be uh, apostles uh, of both the genders. So there is a reference in Romans 16, 7 of um, a lady by the name of Junia, who uh, Paul comments as a notable apostle. Okay, So uh, what we are saying is similar to what we said uh, under the prophetic. Prophetic anointing is both for men and women. Uh, the prophetic office can also be for men and women. Uh, similarly, talking about apostle, office of an apostle, there can be women also in the office of an apostle. So Romans 16 and verse 7, can somebody please uh, turn to that? Yeah. 
ये रोमन सिक्सटीन एंड सेवन Um, can I read? Yes, yes, Elisha. Thank you. Romans chapter sixteen, verse seven. Great Andronicus and Joanna, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners, they are well known to the apostles, and they were in Christ before me. Okay. So yeah. There is a, um, you know, that scripture also tells us that people, uh, Junia was a woman, and yet she was, uh, she was recognized among the apostles. So, uh, what we'll do is, I think we will stop with this, and then we will begin with a study on the scriptures in the New Testament that give us an idea of, uh, you know, who, what the apostolic is all about, you know, from scripture. So then we will try to build our understanding and then come to the practical aspects of, you know, how it is applied in our day and time. Uh, so tomorrow we can begin with chapter two. For now, I'll uh, pause here. Uh, if at all you have any comments, anything else that you want to share with the class, then we can do that now. Can I say something, ma'am? Ah, yes, yes, Louis. Please go ahead. Okay, um, it's an observation. I don't know if it's if it obtains in every any part of the world, but there's a subtle um, conversation among the apostolic um, um, community that suggests that Christ has to appear to you physically before you are authenticated as an apostle. I don't know if that is correct, or I don't know if that is um, obtainable. Hmm. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for sharing that, uh, um, Louis. So you see, I mean, that's the reason I I began by saying that um, mm, there's a lot of theories and philosophies out there about the apostolic. So uh, the best and the right way is to go from scripture. So as we look at scriptures, I think tomorrow uh, we will have the answer to your question. Uh, uh, in short, that's not required. That's not necessary. You know, uh, an encounter with Christ doesn't make one necessarily. I mean, a lot of people have encounters with Christ. Does that make them an apostle? No, right? So, uh, anyway, uh, the answer is no. You don't no, have to have an encounter. Okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Louis. And Sri Kumar has a question here. Yeah, I'll come to you, Sai. Shri Kumar has a question here. He says, how can one, someone come to know whether he is an, called as an apostle or a prophet or a pastor? So um, two ways, Shri Kumar. From the example of um, uh, Paul, we, we know God very clearly, right? Even when he was having that encounter, Jesus spoke to him about, you know, you will go, you will represent me to, to leaders and things like that. So... At the very outset, God can give a person clarity on their call. So that is why sometimes you see like little kids, they may be in school or, you know, I've heard of so many preachers who were preaching at the age of 10, at the age of, uh, you know, 15, 16, because the calling was very clear to them at the beginning. So uh, that way one can know that they are called to a certain office, uh, but it can be the other way as well which is one has no idea that they are called to uh, be an apostle. Like Peter is a good example. You know, Peter, he walked with Jesus. He was a disciple. He knew he had to represent Jesus and do the works of God and all. But you see his, his graph, right? It was like up and down and pretty chaotic. But uh, after the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus, something just came upon him. You could say that because he was so different from the person he was when he denied Christ. You know, during the trial, but after the resurrection, he was a new man, and you know, uh, he was a completely new man after the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Uh, and then, you know, he is he's he's very um, focused, single-minded, and going about his work. So, uh, my inference is he probably did not have a 
a good idea of what what God wanted to do through his life. Only later he realized. So I I think both ways uh, it can happen. Uh, but for the second category, what I say, what I would say is just be obedient. You know, at this point in time, God has called you to do something. Be obedient. Just keep being obedient, and then you know. eventually you come to recognize oh this is what god is doing this is where he is positioning me okay so yeah that's my answer and i hope uh, your doubt is cleared thank you pastor thank you yeah sure thank you shri kumar oh we ran out of time with two hands raised and one uh oh, okay so uh, rose is um, providing some clarification here she says uh, peter was personally commissioned by the resurrected jesus to feed my sheep sure uh, rose and uh, you know you see again you know this came a little uh, later right in the in the journey of peter that's what i meant in the beginning he didn't know but eventually he he knew his role okay so thank you for for sharing that and say elisha please hold on to your questions don't forget it we will we will take up your questions tomorrow and continue All right. Fantastic. So let's. Okay, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Let's uh, close with a word of prayer. Uh, anyone? Yes, Elisha. I'm guessing you want to pray. Father, we thank you, O oh God. Okay, Louis, go, go ahead. No problem. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Father, we thank you, O oh God. We pray sincerely that everyone here finds the grace for which they were called, O oh Lord, in the name of the Lord Jesus. We also pray for the boldness and the skill and understanding to walk in this grace as we are taught in this class. We thank you for our pastor. We thank you for the utterance that you are giving her to speak the word of God with all boldness and not clear understanding. We thank you for every one that our day is blessed and we prosper there in Lord in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you Louis. Thank you everyone. God bless you. See you tomorrow. We'll pick it up from there.